second. One second. We're going to figure out where our feedback is coming from. Okay, that sounds better. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. We truly appreciate you all taking the time to join us for our webinar, the On the Bake Sale Effective and Healthy Fundraising Strategies. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Our webinar is going to run for about one hour, and we will be recording the webinar. Um, and a what recording of that webinar will be shared out with everybody um, in the next few days, including copies of the presenter's slides. So look out for that email. Um, we would also love if you could just take a brief minute at the end to complete a quick survey about the webinar. And for information about CPBUs, if you are in Chicago um, and would like credit for attending this webinar, we will send out that information to you as well. Um, we are going to save the last 10 to 15 minutes of the webinar for a question and answer session. And everybody should have a questions box on the, the control panel on their screen. And we will, um, just throughout the webinar, feel free to send those questions in at any time that you think of them. We'll keep track of all of them, and then we'll save them for our presenters at the end. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today. We have Rosa Ramirez Richter from Healthy Schools Campaign, Tara DiClemente from Chicago Public Schools, Michael Heidkamp, who is the principal at Green Elementary, and Dana Butler, who is the principal at Ruiz Elementary. We thank all of them for joining us today, and thank you again to the, all the participants out there for joining us. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Rosa Ramirez Richter at Healthy Schools Campaign. While I'm doing that, I want to do a quick poll question of our audience um, just to get an idea who, of who is out there. So let us know if you're a principal, teacher, parent, nonprofit advocate, or if you fall into that other category. Um, so Rosa works with a wide range of school leaders, community members, nonprofits, public agencies, and community organizations. She helps schools create healthier school environments where wellness, healthy eating, physical activity, and nutrition education are priorities. She holds a Master of Science degree in Community Development from the University of California at Davis and a Bachelor's degree in Public Policy and Sociology from DePaul University. Um, so take one more minute to, or one more second, sorry, to enter in those answers to the poll. I'll share those results. Um, so it looks like we have a lot of people in that other category. So we would love it if you could just chat in um, if you identified as an other, what category you fall into. A lot of nonprofit advocates, which is wonderful, and parents, which is fantastic. Um, so I am going to go ahead then and hand over our presentation to Rosa. Great. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's staying warm. I know all 50 states are in freezing temperatures today. Um, so here at Healthy Schools Campaign, um, we really focus on the common sense and simple notion that healthy students are better learners. And for the last 10 years, in addition to our work at the state and the national levels, our organization, Healthy Schools Campaign, we work to improve the food and fitness environment in the public schools and in particular uh, in Chicago public schools. But we do work with a variety of stakeholders across the country. So our programs really focus on identifying and supporting agents of change, including parents, teachers, students, principals, and school nurses, and helping them make changes at their own schools. Um, so through that experience and, and all of our other relevant policy work, we've come to understand the importance of empowering individuals. And so for in particular, one of my favorite programs that I facilitate in Chicago is called Fit to Learn, and it's a professional development program at no cost for elementary school teachers um, and principals, and we focus on the K through 5 level. And we really help them integrate nutrition and fitness into everyday subjects and offer them resources to help them meet their, their school's physical activity goals, their ideas on how to help students learn about good nutrition. And of course, part of that is um, school fundraising. And so why healthy fundraisers? I mean, we know that schools are consistently trying, are strapped for cash, and are consistently trying to raise funds to either meet you know, end of year celebrations, eighth grade graduations, et cetera, the list goes on. And in fact, you know, they say most schools, about 76% of schools hold between one and five fundraisers per year. 
and the majority of the time, those fundraisers are, are based on the sales of unhealthy, non-nutritious foods. And so, you know, given, given that, you know, we're all here to promote health and wellness, we think that each fundraiser is an opportunity for schools to model positive, healthy behaviors. And fundraising can be profitable, fun, and healthy. So part of today is really to um, showcase, you know, some of the strategies here in Chicago that we've been doing. And hopefully we can start a, more of a discussion among um, our peers in, in other states. So just to give you a snapshot of what's going on in Illinois and Chicago, um, we obviously, you know, mirror other states with high rates of obesity. These obesity rates are twice as high for minority children in Chicago. Uh, Chicago Public Schools uh, typically has one period or less of physical education per week, um, even though Illinois is one of the few states that mandates um, physical education every day. And also, uh, we just the Chicago Public Health Department just came out with a report um, basically releasing data saying that 43% of Chicago students are overweight or obese. So in particular for our schools here, um, we see healthy fundraising as a, an opportunity to really, you know, reinforce healthy habits and lifestyles for our students and their families. Um, and obviously, you know, we see these, you know, uh, low nutritious, empty calorie fundraisers as undermining student health and learning. Um, it's, you know, here are kind of four points that we really like to categorize. It, you know, obviously does not support a healthy school environment, doesn't promote healthy lifestyle choices, really contradicts what maybe teachers are trying to teach in, in the classroom around nutrition education when you're really asking a student to go out and sell that $1 candy bar. It may seem harmless, um, but in the end it just might lead for some confusion. It also undermines parents' efforts to really, you know, encourage eating healthy or, um, you know, just the practices that they have at home. Um, and in particular, you know, we see companies uh, really trying to enter the school space because it is a captive audience, you know, school, uh, school students and their, and their parents, and it's a way to develop brand loyalty. So it's questionable marketing practices, you know, um, even as seemingly harmless box tops you know, um, you know those little UPC codes that uh, individuals cut off, and, and then they get points, and then they're able to purchase something. Um, it's it's a bit deceiving, and it, and it creates brand loyalty among students. So those are just kind of some of the points that we can go into later about. But um, in particular, in Chicago, you know, the policy here requires schools to create and adopt their own healthy celebrations and fundraising plans. Um, a, li a little bit later, we'll have Tara DeClementon from CPS tell you a little bit about those efforts and, and how that's going in the district. This is their second year in implementing this policy in addition to their wellness policy. Um, but basically how we support schools is through our Fit to Learn Professional Development Program. We have parent education programs and also do you know, uh, a variety of advocacy work at the national and local level. And if you'd love to learn more, visit us at healthyschoolscampaign.org. Great. Thank you so much, Rosa. Um, we really appreciate you providing that overview. And for anybody who's interested, there is Rosa's contact information. Um, and again, please feel free to visit healthyschoolscampaign.org to learn more about our work. Um, so I will now introduce Tara Di Clemente, um, who is a registered licensed dietitian and is the nutrition education coordinator for Chicago Public Schools. She received her BS in dietetics from Purdue University and completed her dietetic internship at the University of Iowa. Tara earned a Master of Public Health degree with a focus in health policy and administration from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her past work experience as a community dietitian serves her well in her role at CPS where her major task is to help schools align with the local school wellness policy requirements by implementing comprehensive nutrition education. So thank you so much, Tara, for joining us. Um, and I will now hand it over to you. Great. Thank you for having me. So just to give some background about why CPS sort of had this uh, impetus to pass a policy besides the fact that, as Rosa said, the majority of our students are overweight or obese. In 2004, Congress 
uh, reestablished all of the nutrition requirements for our meal program, which also then led to the 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which required that school districts establish a local school wellness policy. And within the, the policy, what the criteria that had to be addressed would be nutrition education, physical activity, the guidelines for all foods available on school grounds, uh, just general school-based activities for wellness, and then plans for how we would evaluate the implementation of the policy. Next slide. Sorry, I forgot. I have to say that. <laughs> So in CPS, as Rosa said, in 2012, we passed actually two policies. We passed the local school wellness policy first, and then second, the, about a month later, came our healthy snack and beverage policy. And what these two policies aim to do is to create healthy school environments for all of our students. We have over 400,000 students in the district, and we have uh, just over about 600 buildings, different schools. And so with these policies combined with uh, our work in the Office of Student Health and Wellness and Nutrition Support Services, we're really hoping that we'll do a culture shift and shift to these healthier environments where healthy eating and being physically active become sort of the new norm. Next. So I'm going to go over today more specifically the healthy snack and beverage policy. And the reason is because this is the policy that has the guidelines towards fundraising. The policy really outlines the way that all foods get into the building. So next slide will show all of the sort of the general outlines. So it, this is also could be known as our competitive foods policy. If competitive foods are defined as any other food offered in the school building that is not the school meal. So this is not so our school breakfast, school lunch, after school snack and meal programs, those meals all meet the USDA nutrition requirements. This policy really aims to up the nutrition quality of all the other foods, so whether that be through a la carte, so foods sold on along with the school meal, vending machines, both beverage and snack, any school stores that may be selling food. And then the big ones, which we know a lot of food comes into schools, is our celebrations through student rewards and then, of course, fundraisers. The policy, we've really had a push this year to implement the policy full force. We've been working with schools for about the past two years on our Learn Well initiative, but this year is really our kind of our hard stop. All schools need to be following this policy. And it boils down to three key rules. It can be really confusing. Any of you who have your own policies know that uh, everyone kind of wants to look for loopholes because we still want to have these great celebrations. But it really boils down to no food can be offered <coughs> during a school meal or in place of a school meal. So we can't have a principal's breakfast. We can't have a pizza party for lunch to celebrate a birthday or to celebrate a uh, student achievement, we want to make sure that students are being offered the healthiest options, and so that would be the school meal. The school day, as defined by the USDA, this is a new rule this year, they have decided that midnight to 30 minutes past final dismissal is what defines the school day. So then this leads into the third rule that all food offered to students on school grounds during the school day must meet a specific nutrition criteria. Next slide. For celebrations, what CPS, the CPS policy allows is two school-wide unhealthy celebrations each year. If at your district you've made your own uh, number, it may differ from the state. So here in Illinois, they allow many more unhealthy celebrations. But at CPS, we've really restricted that. We have an average classroom size of 32, so we were really recognizing that 32 birthday celebrations a year was not only eating up a lot of educational minutes, but 32 cupcakes in school on top of all the cupcakes outside of school is just not the kind of a message we want to send. So two unhealthy school-wide celebrations. And then schools just simply email us, which days they're doing. A lot of our schools picked Halloween, and the next big one seems to be Valentine's Day. And schools have really been fine with just emailing us and letting us know. 
Uh, just to reiterate, this does include individual student or classroom celebrations. So we really want to say let's focus on fun instead of food or just bringing in non-food treats for their peers. So having parents send pencils and erasers or stickers instead of cupcakes. You know, students, once the, and you'll hear from some administrators later, but once the shift has been made, students really, they get used to it. Um, there's a lot of, I don't want to steal any thunder, but there's a lot of great ideas happening at other schools um, with celebrations. And then if there is to be food at a celebration, it simply must meet the nutrition guidelines outlined in our policy. Our policy nutrition guidelines actually are a bit more stringent than the USDA guidelines. We don't offer as many beverage options, but um, mostly they're, they're pretty much the same. And we did, for our district, make an approved healthy snack list. It's not comprehensive by any means, but it's a really good start and we've been able to get that out to principals, and teachers, and parents. And it's really helped to take that burden off of those that we want to be following the policy. Next slide. Fundraise well, which is what you're all here for. Uh, really, we have to go by the USDA rules, which are pretty much reflect here at Chicago Public Schools. But any food sold on school grounds, it has to meet specific nutrition criteria. Um, and then for the, it cannot be sold in competition with the meal program. So this one can get tricky because a lot of schools think, well, if Sarah goes through the lunch line and she's done eating, then I can sell her chips right after lunch. The meal time is actually defined from when the first student in the first lunch period goes through the line all the way to the last person. So if Sarah's first and Jose is last in eighth period lunch, that is the entire time of service. So we cannot offer any food, cannot sell to students during that time. Same with breakfast. We have a lot of schools that want to sell hot chocolate or coffee or something during breakfast. Cannot, we cannot do that. And then here's kind of a loophole, but we get a lot of questions about it. Uh, so for food that's sold with the intention of going home, let's say taffy apple, big one during the fall. If the students are not going to be eating it on school grounds, there's an order form. Those fundraisers are fine. We would, of course, encourage healthy fundraisers. So we're working with some of our vendors to have healthier options available. So for instance, a market day or a top box or somewhere where you're ordering, we've been working with those vendors to say, hey, maybe you can just highlight the healthier options that meet our criteria so that families can say, oh, I know that I'm buying something healthy for my family. And then uh, food sold past 30 minutes also uh, is OK. It doesn't apply to the policy. We, of course, though, don't want uh, teachers and staff waiting around that 30 minutes just to sell pizza or just to sell cookies or cupcakes. Instead, you could utilize that 30 minutes if the food is healthy. So we're really, like I said, this is a big culture shift. Um, but once we make the change and put in the work, it's going to be a really good payoff for our students. Next slide. And then finally, this goes, this is just worth putting in here, reward well. Rewards are rewards with foods are strictly prohibited. So this is a big one, more on the teacher level than the school level. Um, typically, when we meet with administrators, once we say no food is rewards, they say, okay, well, do you have good ideas for what I can do for dean's list or honor rolls? We do a breakfast, or we do this or that. And so we've been working creatively with nutrition support services to offer healthy, reimbursable meals through our dining center. So maybe it is catered, but it's all school it's all school food, just maybe it looks a different way or we set it up a different way and we can still make it a special breakfast, but we just know all of the food is aligning and it counts as a student's breakfast. It's not in competition with that. We also like to reiterate that withholding food as a punishment is prohibited, and so this may seem shocking if you've never heard this, but we definitely have found teachers in schools that are either not allowing students to choose a hot meal, they can only have a cold meal if they've misbehaved or didn't do their homework, or they are um, just bringing them a, maybe like a cold peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or it's just there's sort of a punishment meal that's being served, and we absolutely prohibit that. 
And so those really are, I think the next slide is my, just my contact information, but those really are the, the key components of the policy. We try, every time we present, we try to make it a little clearer because it can get really confusing. And anyone who's working on this, which is all of you on this webinar, you can understand that there's some things that just make sense at one point, and then later you might be questioning it. But we've had a lot of success. Uh, really, once the adults wrap their mind around it, then the children are more than happy. It's once you make the change and say, this is how it's going to be, kids love being kids. They love to play. They love to run around. So there's just ways to reward them and celebrate them and fundraise for them that don't include a lot of unhealthy foods. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tara. That was um, a great overview of what's happening in Chicago. And we know that there are a lot of people on the webinar that are not in Chicago. And just to recognize that Chicago does have um, some very strict policies around these issues in place. Um, but we are hoping that the lessons shared through our principals that are going to be speaking next will certainly be relevant um, to work that is taking place anywhere across the country. Um, so thank you, Tara, for that great overview. So next, we're going to um, have Principal Michael Heidkamp join us, um, who's the principal at Green Elementary. I'm going to introduce him. Um, and while I do that, we have another poll question for everybody, wanting to get an idea of whether or not your school has school-wide healthy celebrations and a fundraising plan. Um, so under Michael Heidkamp's leadership, Green Elementary was awarded the gold certification of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. He has worked alongside Green's wellness team to advance a variety of health and wellness projects, including a health night, family cooking classes, aerobics classes, and after-school student programming. He looks forward to supporting the wellness committee's ongoing leadership for this school year. Um, he's been a wonderful supporter of Healthy Schools campaign work, is on our Fitch Learn Principal Advisory Committee, and we truly appreciate him joining us today. Uh, so take one more second to enter in those responses to the poll. So it looks like we have um, a nice split <laughs> of people. Um, about a third of you do not have a healthy celebration plan. A number are working on it. Some have one that's ignored, and then some have one that's followed. Uh, so I'm hoping that through the next two presentations, people will get some ideas about how they can perhaps strengthen that plan or ideas of what they could include in theirs. So we will now hand it over to Principal Heidkamp. Uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is Michael Heidkamp from Green Elementary. Um, just wanted to, to let you know that, that we as a school are figuring this out as we go, too. Um, so it's very much a, a work in progress. Um, but what I wanted to share with you is, is a little bit about kind of the thinking that goes behind the setting up of our uh, of our fundraisers, and in particular, kind of looking at our walkathon, um, which is in its second year, as kind of an example um, of trying to leverage um, fundraising events to do more than just bring in um, bring in money. Next slide. So, um, basically, what you can kind of control in in fundraising is almost everything but the actual amount of money that you're going to be um, receiving. So um, as we put together our walkathon, we we kind of found ourselves a year ago really getting fixated on the money as determining success or failure. Um, that we ended up losing a little bit of sight of the other reasons um, to do a fundraiser that actually have um, uh, little to do with the money, but that also have have real value um, to a community. And so that was kind of the question that we posed to ourselves: is if we took away the money you know, what, what value would there be in still doing this, um, this fundraising work? Next slide. So then we started to think um, about how we could design um, our fundraiser. And by design, that was everything from incentives to how we use the funds that we would, we would gain to who was actually involved in the um, design of the, um, of the fundraiser. Um, to how all those different pieces could be organized um, to support our different goals as a school community. Next slide. So one of the ways um, in which our fundraiser supported our growth as a school um, was that it promoted parent leadership um, in a way that we hadn't experienced prior. Um, we, we don't have a Friends of Green. We're, we're not in necessarily an area of the city where um, 
uh, our parents have access to um, a good amount of wealth or, or, or resources, um, and we don't have any sort of formal fundraising raising arm. But what we did have was a newly formed health and wellness committee, um, a parent committee, um, and the walkathon actually ended up being a great vehicle to get parents involved um, and involved in a in a really structured way, but that would um, add value, very concrete um, value to our community and something that they could see and feel proud of afterwards. Because what we're finding with our parents is a lot of them are new to that leadership role. A lot of them are taking a huge risk in stepping up, um, even in, in, in the role of being part of the Health and Wellness Committee, and giving them some quick wins and ways in which they can see how they're immediately adding value to the school community is incredibly empowering for them. So the, the walkathon became an opportunity to develop that leadership. Next slide. So um, we also found the fundraiser um, to be a great opportunity to develop community. And so we were thinking about, you know, now that we've decided kind of who's going to be working on the design of it and involved in it, um, who is going to actually be the individuals that were going to be raising the funds? Was it going to be just a portion of our, um, uh, of our student body? And what we ultimately decided is no, that we wanted everybody um, to be part of it. From our, so we're a pre-K through fifth grade school. We have a little over 600 students. And that we wanted everyone to be part of it. So that was another piece in deciding on the walkathon was that even our pre-K students um, could be part of that, that work and get excited about it and feel as though they were they are contributing, and a lot of the contribution is, is just by walking um, and feeling as though um, uh, you know, you're part of something, something bigger. And we'll talk a little bit about what we put the funds into and how we kind of contextualize that for, um, for students. So um, another way in which this kind of developed community was um, uh, building the beds together. So one of the, the, the pieces that we put our money into and the main area in which we invested our money ultimately was um, in creating garden beds. We, we have some raised beds, but we ended up investing in six more um, raised beds. And our students and our teachers and our families were involved in the process of building those um, those beds. So even after the walkathon, um, the walkathon continued to allow us to develop more and more community within our within our school and give us a variety of different opportunities to do so, including over the summer with planting and harvesting from those very same beds. Um, and then one of the things that we did um, was also have a, uh, a sporting event. So the way that it worked was for students who donated over, were able to get donations over $75, they got sort of a golden ticket to a faculty support uh, sporting event where the faculty and staff played um, uh, um, basketball, and so um, in addition to sort of promoting health and wellness amongst our um, adult faculty and, and staff and our students, um, it also was a great way to build um, community, just school-wide community. The kids had a, a great amount of fun at it and really enjoyed the opportunity to see their, their teachers in that way. Next slide. So also um, this idea of um, building um, building student leadership, right? So like I said before, all, all students pre-K through fifth um, were able to um, participate. Um, they were the ones that were generating the, um, the funds by walking, so, and they were able to see the product of their work. I think you can't underestimate how empowering that is for a child to feel like what they're doing is actually resulting in some sort of change. And that change for us went beyond just kind of the building of the bed. Um, to really creating additional resources for our school and for our community and changing sort of uh, a lifestyle um, of, um, uh, of the members of our, uh, of not only our school community, but our larger neighborhood community as well. Um, they also obviously had a choice in deciding what we were going to use the funds to purchase. Um, so that was a big um, piece as well for them to actually decide um, how they were going to um, uh, utilize the funds raised. They, um, they designed, so one of the incentives we had too was um, after a certain amount of donations, one of the opportunities you had was to, um, or one of the incentives was to get a T-shirt, and that T-shirt was a, a walkathon T-shirt that was designed by um, by students. So we had a little competition for the design of the T-shirts, and so um, so that once again was able to bring in even more students um, into the process of not only the walkathon itself, but also into the process of developing incentives to encourage their peers um, to to participate. Um, 
And then once again, ultimately, the students were involved in the building of the beds, planting and harvesting. We actually have a, an opportunity for them to bring the food into the cafeteria. So it just created it sort of layers of opportunities for students to step up and take on leadership roles that they hadn't previously. Next slide. So um, this idea of uh, um, reinforcing shared values. And so one of the things that we, you know, that, that we are um, is a school that values health and wellness. Um, and you know, once again, the reason, and it was made loud and clear to people as to why we were doing this. We were up front right away as soon as we um, decided on the garden beds, letting everyone know that that's where the, the money was going. And I think that's, a, that's an important thing, too, that, that I'm always learning as a school leader is the importance of transparency in that process, um, that you always want to make sure that people know exactly what they're donating to, that you're preparing students to be able to go out and, and, and ask for that um, money and for families to be able to ask for that money and know that that's where that money is going to go. And I think the more concrete the, um, uh, the fundraising objectives can be and the more concrete whatever you're coming out of the fundraising is, the better because then they can actually, families can actually see and community members can actually see where their money is going. And, and in this case, those beds were a real physical reminder of that, along with our commitment as a community to continue to promote um, health and wellness. Also, in addition to the T-shirt incentives, we had water bottles, backpacks, um, and so it was. It was really fun to um, uh, to see kids, you know, doing this number one for themselves and for their community and for their school, but then also working in incentives. You know, the, the faculty staff basketball game, these water bottles, the backpacks that also promoted our values and extended the values of health and wellness even um, even further. Next slide. So, um, so what we were able to do as a result of our first annual walkathon, um, we ended up raising over um, six thousand um, dollars. We were able to add six beds to our garden. Um, as a result of that, um, we harvested five pumpkins, um, kale, corn, squash. You can see it all there. We had a really nice um, harvest, um, and then over the summer, which is always a struggle for us to keep kind of families involved, we had um, twenty families that were. Um, working on a weekly basis to on the upkeep and harvesting of the of the bed. So as I mentioned before, it was another nice opportunity to have people here and actively involved over the summer in ways that we hadn't had them before, and doing so in families. So you know, like parents and their children working in the garden together, which which for our community, which is um, heavily Latino, that's that's a big part of who they are. Um, and many of them are first generation. Uh, a lot of them are from Mexico, um, from Central America, and so. Um, it also gave a great opportunity to really sort of recognize um, who we are as a community and celebrate that um, and to put our parents in a role of teachers, um, which I think is you, you, you can't do enough um, in, a, um, in a school community. Um, so that kind of gives you an overview of, um, of sort of the approach that we took and that we try to take not only with the walkathon but with other fundraisers of seeing them really as much more than just ways to bring money into the school, but making sure that at all levels they resonate and promote and actually grow um, our values as a school community. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation, and it's always exciting to hear about what's happening at Green Elementary. Um, so our next presenter is Dana Butler. I just want to make do a quick check. Dana, are you there? Yes, I am. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so we will go ahead and introduce Dana, um, but briefly we're going to do another poll question um, just to get some more input from our audience. We want to know what you think are the biggest barriers to implementing healthier non-food fundraisers in your school or in schools if you're not directly um, working in a school. So Dana is the principal at Irma C. Ruiz Elementary, um, which is part of the Pilton Little Village Network in Chicago. He's in his 26th year with Chicago Public Schools, 11th year as principal, and 25th year at Ruiz School, which is fantastic. He's a proud CPS alumni and a proud partner with Healthy Schools Campaign. And under his leadership, Ruiz was awarded the gold level of the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. And Dana is also a member of our Fit to Learn Principals Advisory Committee um, and has done a wonderful job of helping principals across the city create healthier school environments. So we are so happy to have him here with us today. 
So we're going to close that poll and share the results. Um, just to get an idea of some of the barriers, so the per perception that people can't raise money, um, lack of time, getting support from um, school communities. So it's, a, it's an even split, but it looks like the perception that money can't be raised through healthy school fundraisers is, a, um, is one of the primary barriers. So maybe that's something we can speak a little bit to during the question and answer session. Um, so now we will go ahead and hand it over to Principal Butler. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, and uh, sorry about the tech technical difficulties at the beginning, so I'll curb some of my time. <laughs> um, and just as a sidebar, uh, Michael and I did not speak uh, b before we did our presentation, so if you hear many replications, um, it's probably because they're probably pretty, pretty good uh, effective practices. Uh, just one quick thing about uh, our school. We service pre-K through eighth grade. We have about 850 students and about 90 staff members. Uh, next slide. So I started off with the challenges. World's finest chocolate, only a dollar a bar. Uh, historically, our school for the last 25 years has used this to uh, decrease specifically for eighth grade graduation uh, to just cut their cut their cost. And the profit margin has been between twelve and fifteen thousand uh, dollars. The historical and structural symbolic frame of that is the school thinking that that's the only way that schools or people or any institutions can raise money are around candy and cupcakes and you know those types of those types of items. And as I put there, not even a wet baby likes change, even though it, it will feel better later. It, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset of an adjustment that we're trying to work through. And uh, one of the things is that the purpose of the original, the original fundraiser was to reduce the cost but still increase the uh, student opportunities especially when you're struggling with uh, funds and whatever whatever district that you're working in everybody is having their own you know their own struggles with how they're using their funding even if they feel like they're getting a lot of funding there's still always more that you need to try to uh, work with uh, next slide so here's an alternative our parents rocks and this is our, our Ruiz parents doing their version of edible arrangements of taking an opportunity to get some local and homegrown fruit uh, and opportunities to create as a as a possible fundraiser. You know, obviously falling into uh, making sure that we're following the guidelines that match any food that's being used within the within the school, and also keeping always keeping in mind uh, allergens and 504 plans that are important when you are doing those. And uh, you know we most certainly are going to be in a better communication with uh, with uh, uh, the actual department and uh, uh, sorry for a second there uh, for Tara to make sure that we are following and making sure that we're staying on the policy. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of the benefits: uh, students explore positive opportunities to raise funds while helping another cause. This kind of speaks to what. Uh, Mike, I love the first slide where he talks about trying to find real values, real, real values of fundraisers. Because if it's just, to, if it really is just about that profit and it doesn't have some intrinsic or, or intentional values that are around health or social emotional learning or whatever it is, sometimes I think it does fall by the wayside, and the, the what you receive financially doesn't really, it doesn't seem like it's as important. And uh, helping the students to find a true value in food and what what food is really, you know, what's the purpose of it? It's, a, it's not a competition despite what we see like with Nathan's hot dogs on 4th of July. You know, it's really to help our bodies to grow and sustain and be healthy so we can uh, live long, productive, active lives. And really just looking at, like I said, looking at the difference of food versus funds. It's not a trophy around that. And even though even as adults we still use going out to dinner sometimes as a celebration, I think we have to kind of curtail our mindsets of 
how we how we make that presentation that you know we're still doing or eating what we're doing, but that's not the, the celebration part is not the we've got this food. Um, students are uh, able to use these uh, academic skills. So here's your here's your common core hook for all of the people who may have to kind of deal with whether it's district or network or area, whatever it is. Uh, have the students, and this is something that was mentioned earlier, have the students be part of the planning, uh, using the math skills to figure out profit margins. Uh, social sciences, historically, try to go back and find out what have fundraisers done in that community, or even at historical aspects of where people have done great fundraising. Uh, three, you know, always incorporating the health, physical education, and nutrition benefits of this. Uh, another one would be with the arts. They can create wonderful promotional designs or using music and speech to create even uh, commercials and promotionals. So there are lots of different, there are lots of different ways to uh, incorporate that, that student part that we spoke of earlier. Next slide. Uh, fundraiser in progress. Um, we were asked to speak to one if we were actually trying to, to do this, and, and, I, and I, you'll see another slide later that says hooks, hooks and levers. But since, since this is our 25th anniversary, this is a great opportunity to reach back and build out of our alumni support from all the way from 1989 and, and present, using every type of social media that we can to reach out, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to spread the word on how we're making the change, how we're making those adjustments. And also staff alumni. You've got people who have left your building, retired, uh, that are still feel an important part of the family. Having them be a part to help to promote this as well. Uh, I, the one that we're actually working on will be a 5K to celebrate the history of the school and the community and uh, you know the essence and the history of what Irma C. Ruiz means to our school. Uh, she was the only female officer killed in the line of duty. and. Uh, the very, very next year, uh, and she was protecting children, the very next year our school was named after her. So we're in great contact with the family, and they have a personal uh, buy-in to this as well. So we have this goal of the 25,000 running laps around our school, so teachers and kids have pedometers. Uh, we think we're going to exceed that even with the, the weather, the weather possibilities and whether we're on the stairs. And it's just something that is important, important to us to uh, find and in incorporate more healthier opportunities that we'll feel better about and be excited about. And making sure that the celebrations for the school are not just about eighth grade graduation. As much as that might be uh, you know, an average cost for some of the opportunities that we want for our, our children to experience, you know, they could, I could say $180, and somebody might say, oh, that's pretty low. We pay more than that for this. Or somebody might say it's very, very hot. It's just very relative. But we need to think more in terms of a school-wide thing as opposed to making one entity an island. Uh, next slide. Historical fundraiser data. This is something uh, that uh, we were at, I was asked to mention. That's what we've done, world's finest chocolate. And I said done because of put it to rest, and we've said a, a prayer for it. Uh, Great Western is something that we've done twice a year. And it's hook, because I heard that also mentioned as well, how you can try to uh, supplant or make something sound a little bit differently than it is. It was candy, but it was magazines and gift wrapping paper and those kinds of things. So that's how you kind of added it in to make it seem like it was semi-okay. Uh, the carnation sale that we do about uh, Valentine's Day, uh, that was a fundraiser that was specific for trying to, uh, we're, we're fine in performing arts magnet cluster school, even though we're a neighborhood school and uh, not, don't be thrown by the magnet. We've only had one kid off of application in uh, 17 years. And uh, so we're still, as I call, regular. But most of the time it's for our choir to attend a, uh, a musical or a opera or something that gives them another opportunity. We used to have the Olivia 5K run that we, we ran in all the time for many years. Uh, but there was a change in guard over there, so they did not have it. So that gave us a perfect opportunity to incorporate and move into that, that spot ourselves. Uh, next slide. Here are some of the hooks and levers that I were talking about. Uh, 
promoting those opportunities. Our students were asked to go and perform for to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month at the race school. So those are some of the dancers. Uh, you'll see that we have an uh, outdoor concert uh, the first Friday of every June. You're most certainly invited. We have a morning, uh, afternoon, and evening uh, performance. Uh, the kids go out. Uh, they have a healthy lunch that's prepared by the prepared by the uh, the lunchroom staff, and the shirts are promoting the 25th anniversary, and they're going to be part of uh, some of the giveaways for the the students who are able to raise the funds and really, really do a, a great promotion on this. Uh, next slide. So this is the this is the big deal. This is the major hitter right here. And um, create create an interest. Really, really talk about what's going on. And my creating my interest with you would be I want to tell you that uh, we were one of the first uh, schools to have a kitchen and community garden. So one of the things that came out of that is we've got each one of the beds and the bins has a classroom assignment to it. And we also have parents who actually monitor the summer. But we're taking, with the help of my buddy Bill Hook over at the Chicago Agricultural School, we're able to plant some things so we can actually make small jars of salsa, healthy salsa as part of a, a fundraiser. Uh, once again, we'll make sure to run through Terra to make sure that it fits into all of the guidelines. Uh, we also have uh, Common Threads, which is a cooking program for our fourth and fifth grade students where they learn about nutrition, portion size, uh, all about salt, sodium content, sugar, and they're very, very healthy, approved uh, recipes that the kids, uh, and we have a fall and a, a spring session there. So I wouldn't dare want to leave them out, Chef Aleka. And also, may I have this dance from Margot Toppin where we promote that physical aspect as part of our uh, our next venture that's going to be a dance-a-thon. It's still in the works. That's why I didn't put it in. Uh, creating that goal, uh, we've all spoken to that, trying to make sure that you have a goal of what you think is important. Uh, getting buy-in. Health and Wellness Committee, we have kids, parents, teachers, and community administration that are all on there. The community part is important because those are the stores that the kids are going to to buy the chip, hot chips and the things and the sodas. So trying to get them at least an idea of what we're trying to do in the school. We're not trying to run them out of their, their business and livelihood, but just so they have an idea of what we're trying to do to find their own delegate balance. Uh, reflect and adjust. Trying to see what works, take a step back, and then try to make some important adjustments. Uh, the reinvigorate, uh, this is where it gets tough, where you start to see those obstacles, stepping stones, the naysayers, uh, we can't do this, we don't have enough money, why are we doing this, we don't have time. Try to find the little pieces that you can celebrate. And uh, the sixth is just do it. You know, just get out there and do this thing. Uh, even if it's not ready, start it. You will see some value. Then reach out to, uh, you know, Healthy Schools Campaign. Reach out to Fit to Learn. Reach out to uh, a CPS because you can always help to give you some kind of guidance. You're not going to necessarily tell you what to do, but based on your point of reference to help you. And enjoy it. Thank the people that you uh, that you planned with for the next year. Uh, one last, just one last uh, quote on this one is. Uh, it's been very difficult to implement the change, simply because it calls for such significant change. So I used to speak to moderation all the time, but at some point you have to leave the moderation and just have very, very clear, consistent, transparent communication with all of your stakeholders around these changes. You can always refer back to them. Uh, thank you so much. It has uh, been my pleasure to speak to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dana. That was a great overview of what's happening at Ruiz Elementary and some wonderful ideas for folks to take back to their schools. So we will go ahead now and jump right into our question and answer session. Feel free to keep on sending in questions that you might have thought of throughout the webinar. Um, so the first question I'm actually going to ask of Mike and Dana. Um, we had somebody say that they actually get the most complaints and resistance for healthy fundraisers from parents. And so is that something, do you have ideas for how you've shared this information with parents and gotten buy-in from parents to support healthy fundraisers? 
Yeah, so, you want to go first, um, Mike? Yeah, yeah, David, do you mind? Is that okay? Right. Um, so I think one of the ways, um, and, I, and I spoke of this in, in the presentation, is um, having a health and wellness committee on site um, that is parents um, <laughs> is really, really critical because, um, uh, you know, having parents who live in that same community speaking to other parents and talking to them about their own experiences and sort of that testimonial approach I think is is really, really critical um, to building trust, right, as you go through a process of change. I, I also have to say that having a good foundation with parents goes a long way. So we had, um, prior to really initiating these changes, um, for at least a year, year and a half, we, we had really developed a culture in the school of opening the school up, of having parents in classrooms, of having them really, really engaged. And from that, we were able to, um, number one, build trust, but then secondly, build some parent leadership. And so I think that, uh, that's a critical piece is, um, uh, is really trying to get parents as involved as possible, but then also being really careful to protect them because you don't want them going out and then feeling under attack, right, and then, um, uh, and then retreating because you can lose a lot, of, a lot of credibility very quickly with that. So I think it's, we kind of just went like step by step with the process, as Dana said, um, you know, being super transparent, but allowing parents slowly to lead um, that process rather than it coming from um, the administration or, or faculty. Okay, I got some very quick bullet points. Acknowledge where they're at because they're in different places. That what they remember about school is quite different than what they may see now. Even a kid who's a parent who graduated 10 years ago, they're in a different place. And speak to their needs whether it's around the health, obesity, around the importance of allergens, uh, modeling. It always helps when I'm modeling this or teachers are modeling this or we're showing that we're drinking water or we're not drinking the soda pop and showing how important it is. That has gone away. That's gone a long way, but at some point acknowledging where they're coming from because they don't necessarily understand. And I have a grandparent who looks like they're in tears and they're bringing cupcakes up and somehow or another they didn't get the message from their son or daughter who's a parent. You have to be very empathetic with them and just uh, and explain the importance. Yeah, and if I could add just one, one, one more thing along those lines too, is, and also understanding that food means different things to different people, right, and that that can be a, a very personal choice um, for people. And, and, and so once again, respecting um, respecting that as well, and, and as Dana said before, trying to meet them where they're at. We have specific cooking classes run by parents for other parents so that they're able to talk about the traditional meals that are made and how do you still make them, um, but make them in a healthier way. Great. Thank you so much. And I'll also add that Healthy Schools Campaign does have a toolkit that they've put together in partnership with Chicago Public Schools about how to engage parents in uh, healthy school practices. And so we would be happy to share that link in the email that goes out to everybody after. Um, and Mike and Dana, we've had a number of people ask if you have policies that you've written for your schools around these issues, or if you just use Chicago Public Schools. I think people would like to see examples of policies, and we're curious if that's something you put together. Well, I, I, I use the CPS policies, but I also have a letter that gives a little bit more clear, and this is with all due respect to any policies that any districts write. Anytime that there is a word that says should or may or something where somebody feels like they can kind of plan around it or they can say they didn't understand. So we have to be very, very clear, and we always ask for a response. If you need a clarification, please send this back to ask us because we want to make sure that we can't, we can't assume that we, I can't, they can't, we can't assume that I understand all of the policies as read. I have to ask. That's why I'll call Tara. That's why I'll call Rosa. I'll call Christy. I'll ask people. Help me to, help me to understand that because we've done that before, especially around the, the two uh, unhealthy uh, allotments for those celebrations. You have to really, really be able to get a clear communication so everybody hears the same message. Yeah, and I, I, we do the exact same thing, um, and I think, you know, we really try to present it as advocating for children and for families um, as well and frame it 
um, frame it in that way when we when we do send out those correspondences. And then, um, as Dana was saying as well, kind of send out reminders to people and also workshops. You know, so if, if you want to come in and, and we're offering a workshop on on healthy lunches and how to like in a in a snap put together a healthy lunch for your child, here are some opportunities and and, and, and times where you can come in and um, uh, and learn a little bit about how to do that. And just to add, Alex, um, as part of our Fit to Learn professional development program, we also develop, with the help of our, our principal advisory, template letters and oh, right. bilingual in both English and Spanish uh, to parents, and but also to teachers kind of outlining what the expectations are for the school around fundraisers and rewards. So we're happy to share those resources as well. Wonderful. So we'll be sure to share, share that information. Um, a question from Mike, what were the levels of incentives for the t-shirt water bottles and backpacks for your program? Sure, we did um, $25 um, to $50 was the, um, was the water bottle, 50 to 75 was the backpack, and they were very kind of like nice looking but, but simple sort of like one pocket backpacks, and then um, Seventy-five dollars and above was the uh, were the student-made t-shirts. Great, thank you. Um, we've had a number of per, uh, participants ask if we could give even more ideas of ideas for healthy fundraisers, which is a great suggestion. And just in the interest of time, what we'll do is we have a tip sheet that lists a number of um, ideas for healthy fundraisers, and so we'll be sure to share that around in um, the email that goes out. So I'm going to do one more question for Rosa, um, which is wanting clarification on who enforces the healthy snack and beverage policy, and then are there any consequences if schools don't comply with the policies? Right. That's a great question, Alex. And since Tara had a skip out early who represents CPS, I'll, I'll take that for her. Um, this is the second year of the policy, and of course it takes time, as many of us have said, to create change. So at the moment, the way that Chicago schools are structured, there's um, a Chicago Board of Education, but then they're at the at the local level, there's a local school council that has quite a bit of authority. They have you know authority to hire and fire a principal, uh, set the school budget, et cetera, et cetera. So part of the enforcement of the wellness policy and the competitive foods policy is that they have to submit a quarterly report on how they're doing uh, in implementing these practices to the local school council. And of course, this is obviously policy speak, and it's you know, taken a year, uh, two years, you know, to really drill down to, to the school level that this is part of the reporting process at the local school level, um, uh, level uh, to report what's going on. Um, so there's that, but also um, at the district level, if there are funds that are collected uh, in a way that contradicts the competitive foods policy, then all those fun funds are forfeited, um, which is not, you know, the greatest way to, I mean, obviously that's great enforcement, but hopefully we can take steps before it gets to that point, you know, because you're really not willing, winning any allies in that sense, but um, those are the enforcement mechanisms. And, you know, just to add, we can send out the link to the CPS actual policy language. I think it's, it includes great model language for other school districts to look at and really think about what they, they can take from there um, and use for their own school districts. Great. Thank you. So we will be sure to email everybody with a link to a recording of the webinar slides and then a number of resources that we've mentioned um, today. So that is it for our webinar. Thank you so much to everybody who took the time to join us this morning, and a huge thank you to our presenters for taking the time of their busy days to share the wonderful work that they're leading. Um, we appreciate everybody joining us and hope that you're able to join us on future webinars. Enjoy the rest of your day.